Hello, hello, hello. Fresh hope. <clears throat> Welcome to another sermon from the Spring Hill Church of Christ, meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bonds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also beasts of the field and birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend, let no one accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Reading Hosea chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. Now, as with many of the writings of the prophets, the message to the Jews from Hosea was one of judgment. In this particular section of the book, the prophet condemns his condemnation of the people as a result of their lack of knowledge of God and his law. For that lack of knowledge, they would be rejected as God's priests and their children would be forgotten. We would hope that the conditions of the people who claim God would be improved today. But sadly, that isn't the case many times. According to an article by Albert Maurer, president of the Baptist Theological Seminary, the spiritual knowledge of our country is sorely lacking. Researchers George Gallup and Jim Castile put the problem this way. Americans reveal the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. And because they don't read it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. So we want to talk in this lesson for a few minutes about biblical illiteracy, the great growth killer. We find in that survey we referred to by George Gallup, fewer than half of the adults can name the four gospel accounts. Many professed Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the apostles. According to 82% of Americans, God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. The majority of adults believe the Bible teaches that the greatest purpose in life is taking care of one's family. At least 12% of adults believe Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Over 50% of graduating seniors believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were husbands and wife. A considerable number of respondents to one particular poll believe the Sermon on the Mount was preached by none other than Billy Graham. 60% of Americans can't name even five of the Ten Commandments. George Barna notes, no wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are. His overall conclusion is increasingly America is biblically illiterate. This is wherein the true issue resides. The problem isn't simply that Americans and Christians don't know enough biblical facts to compete well in Bible trivia. The problem rests in the fact that biblical illiteracy is a great growth killer because it hinders strong spiritual growth. This truth is put forth very well by Mr. Mahler when he says we will not believe more than we know and we will not live higher than 
our beliefs. Albert Mahler, there's his statement that we just referred to. And it used to be said of the members of the Lord's church that they were walking and talking Bibles because their basic biblical knowledge was so strong and so deep. Can that still be said today in 2024? I'm not sure if I can confirm that as being the case anymore. But that doesn't mean that we can't get back to that place where we are known as a people of the book. In order to do that, however, we must acknowledge the presence of biblical illiteracy and why it happens, what its consequences are, and what can be done to remedy this great problem. So we began by asking the question, why does it happen? First of all, I believe one of the reasons it happens is apathy and misplaced priorities. People don't know the Bible because they simply don't care enough to know the Bible. As with any sort of academia or intellectual endeavor, knowing the Bible is going to take some time and hard work. With over 780,000 words contained within the Bible, there is no way one can become knowledgeable without putting in the time. And no one is going to put in that kind of time to know the Bible if they don't truly want to know it. Sadly, since there are so many who do not know, want to know the Bible, they're not putting in the time and thus the epidemic of biblical illiteracy is on the scene. There are plenty of people who say that they do care about God and His Word. They say that they want to learn and grow in their biblical knowledge, but the reason they don't know more than they know is because they simply don't have enough time. At least that's what those types of people tell themselves. They lack in the biblical illiteracy that they say they want and they blame it on time. And yet these same people are incredibly knowledgeable of other facts of life. They can tell you about all things pertaining to sports, academia of some sort, politics and the like. But let that be the Bible and that claim is something they treasure, but that's just not the case. And that God, that they claim to be, well, for some reason, they don't have such knowledge about them at all. If ever there was a practical application that could be taken from Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 9, Matthew 6 and verse 9, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Besides that of avoiding materialism, this must be it. We say that we treasure God and His Word, but how much knowledge have we built up concerning the Word? If we look at our lives and recognize that we don't know all that much about the Bible, and yet we know everything about other con uh, temporal uh, sense of life, then can we truly say that our heart can be found in the Lord? If we are all being honest, then we must recognize that we can say no such thing. If we do not care about God and His Word, or if we haven't arranged our lives in such a way that God and His Word are getting plenty of real attention and dedication, then there is no way that we will be biblical, literate, and in a position to establish and develop strong and thriving faith. How about postmodernism? The postmodern mindset can be simplified in the understanding that there is no real absolute truth. 
that must be understood and accepted. This type of mindset obviously stands in opposition to what the Bible claims about itself in Psalm 119 and in verse 60, where the psalmist says, the sum of your word is true and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Jesus further affirms the word of the psalmist when he says in John chapter 17 and verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We see the Bible as being everlastingly beneficial for mankind and therefore worthy of our attention and learning. But that isn't how everybody sees it. Some people see the Bible as being antiquated or out of date. And while it might have been good truth for people back when it was written, they feel like it is no longer useful today in the 21st century. Besides, who would want to be willing to submit themselves to lots of rules that just restrict when you can do in your life what you want. Why not just live your life the way you want to live it according to your own truth? You see, when this type of mindset is present and thriving in society, a natural result is a bunch of people who see no need for and have no respect for the scripture. With this being our current reality to a certain extent, it shouldn't surprise us that we are reaping the negative consequences of allowing biblical illiteracy to take place in our world. Well, what are the consequences of biblical illiteracy? First of all, I believe scriptural weakness. When people are ignorant toward the Bible and they have no real grasp over what God desires for them in their lives, why would we expect for them to be willing to stand strong for God's truth in a world where they will be pressured from every side to go against God's will? As Mahler notes in his article, why would we expect a society that sank Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife to take a strong stand against homosexuality? Additionally, if we live in a society where many are ignorant to the understanding that all men are made in the image of God, then how can we expect for abortion and racism to be seen as evil? If we live in a society where marriage is not understood as being a divinely given institution, then why would we expect for society as a whole to respect God's will for mankind's marriages? You see, if men are ignorant to God's word, and, uh, and will then why would they behave in a way besides according to their own sinful fleshly desires? And this includes those of his son's body. In fact, if we know God's word, then we know that this has been the case anytime men forget God. Just take a moment to consider Hosea 4 verses 1 and 2, where he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bonds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. When God is forgotten, then his will is not followed, and men will find themselves engaging in all sorts of evil and wickedness. Then there's misunderstanding. Beyond just the basic spiritual weakness that comes from being biblically malnourished, we must also consider that biblical illiterate people still try to use the Bible at times and that only leads them falling into the proverbial ditch of misunderstanding. If we truly want to understand and comprehend God's Word, then we must dig into the Word and extract its truth. 
We must be, as 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth type of people. When it comes to our handling of God's word, if we want to be a people who accurately understand and handle the word, then it must we must be a people who are giving attention to its teaching and connecting the dots of Scripture. We cannot expect to be people whose faith are firmly built upon the strong foundational principles of God's Word, particularly as we find in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Paul said, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with all patience, and he says, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in you all. Well, if we are biblical illiterate, this is why we run up against so many people in the world that have a faithful, a faulty understanding of God's Word. They think they have a grasp upon God's Word based solely upon some book or some preacher that they respect. They might read those books, listen to those men, but if they have never actually dug into the book for themselves, then they are no better off in reality, because their understanding is only built upon the fallible teachings of men. Surely, this only leads to the next stage of ditch finding where the blind are leading the blind, yet this is not the end of the consequences of biblical illiteracy because misunderstanding only leads to misapplication. When we don't understand God's Word properly, then what we will quickly find are people who are using God's Word improperly. How often do we hear people around us try to use the Bible against Christians who had taken a stance against some sort of immorality? Take, for instance, something that I have seen numerous times when it comes to the topic of homosexuality, especially on social media discussions, debates, and dumpster fires, I guess you'd call it, or Facebook even. Uh, you, you see all kinds of destruction, uh, all kinds of debates where people try to use the Bible on those who are opposing homosexuality. They don't have a understanding of the Bible. They're biblically illiterate. Someone will state their belief that marriage is only between a man and woman. And they can even quote Leviticus chapter 18 and in verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman it is abomination as a supporting text. Someone will then turn around and start naming off other portions of the law of Moses, and they will ask why those things aren't followed as well. Do you eat shellfish? Do you eat pork? Do you wear clothes of different fabrics? All these questions are asked because under the law, these things were forbidden. They were not permitted. Yet we know as people who understand how the Bible works that we are not under those restrictions because our covenant with God is not that covenant. It's not the Old Testament. This whole conversation could almost be avoided if people would just explain the teachings of Jesus on marriage in Matthew chapter 19. But again, 
that would require them having a firm grasp of the Bible as a whole. I truly hope that we are getting the point that misunderstanding of the Bible that comes from biblical illiteracy will only lead to further misapplications and problems. Yet these things don't have to exist because there are some solid remedies to biblical illiteracy. How can we remedy biblical illiteracy? Well, first of all, family devotional times. If we are wanting to fix a societal problem such as biblical illiteracy, then we must begin in the bedrock of society, and that is the home. Parents have the ability to change the direction in which society is going by leading their children in the ways of the Lord from an early age. We know well what Paul instructs fathers to do in respect to their leading of children from Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 1. He says, uh, Deuteronomy 6, actually, he said, this is the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you and that you may do them in the land in which, he says, the land in which you are going to cross over. He says, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God at you and your son and your son's son by keeping all the statutes and the commandments which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And as these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, you shall teach them diligently, watch this now, to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as signs on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Family devotional time. The Lord makes the recipe for national success very clear to Moses, and Moses then passes it along to the people. If they wanted to have prolonged days of success, then they had to be busy teaching their kids to, as Deuteronomy 6 and verse 2 says, to fear the Lord your God, to keep all His statutes and His commandments. Does this mean that every single one of our kids is going to turn out to be strong, faithful Christians? Obviously, that is the hope and the goal, but the kids have a mind of their own and will do as they see fit as they get older. However, as parents, we only are doing them a disservice when we don't put them in the best possible situation to become strong Christians by not having dedicated times to focus on spiritual things. If we allow them to grow up under our roofs without seeing spiritual things as the main focus, then why would we expect for them to suddenly change once they leave and be better with their families? If we want to break the cycle of biblical illiteracy, then we must begin by giving strong attention to the Bible in our homes. It's not just about living the Bible, but it's about opening it as a family and learning from it together. And then there needs to be biblical emphasis in the church. The home is only the beginning because we know that the church has a role to play in helping to build up biblical knowledge, the biblical knowledge of its members. Churches must emphasize spiritual growth and knowledge and faith and living. The church is not a 
social or recreational institution. It's solely a spiritual institution. One, one of the sermons recently we referred to as the church being a spiritual hospital. It's not a spiritual food pantry. It's, a, it's a, not a physical food pantry. It's a spiritual hospital. And I guess you could say a spiritual food pantry because we provide the God's Word. We teach God's Word. And it's, the Bible must be emphasized, must be focused upon, because it is the truth of God's Word that will help us to be pleasing to God. And this is clearly seen in Ephesians chapter 4, and in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, he, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to what? He says, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, the church is to be built up, the members of the body, so that they are strong in faith and knowledge of God, of the Son of God. How can we know Jesus unless we are committed to knowing His will in the Bible? The church must stress and emphasize biblical consideration and teaching. I was recently speaking with a woman who was sharing an experience with her grandson had had in attending a denominational church in a community. It was a service focused on young people, and they were studying from Jonah. But the young man complained that he didn't need to hear about Jonah. He just wanted to hear about things that were applicable to his life as a young man. Now, sadly, I've heard that type of mentality from more people than just this young man. And it is an extremely poor mentality because it paints the biblical narrative as not being applicable today in our lives. And this, brethren, couldn't be any further from the truth. The stories within our Bible are profitable for teaching. As Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. If we want to learn about fleeing lust, then consider the stories of Joseph and David. If we want to learn about suffering and how to deal with that when we need to, read Job. Do we need some teaching on pride and arrogance? If so, let's go to King Saul and the example, his bad influences, and consider the mistakes of King Rehoboam and listening to his peers instead of the wise elders. Or by the way, these are all from the Old Testament. If our young people are not seeing the value of the, young te of the Old Testament, then there's a problem. And then there's personal desire and responsibility. As Psalm 119 and verse 47 tells us, I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes there. Maybe no other portion of Scripture, of the Psalm, better captures what we ought to be, what ought to be our mindset than we find in verse 97 through 104, where he says there, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemy, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding, he says, than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back, he says, my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are the words of my, of my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And through your precepts, he says, I get understanding. Therefore, he said, I hate every false way. Now, do we truly love God's law? 
Do we love his word? If we do, then we will be dedicated to it, and it will be not be said of us that we are biblical illiterates because our love has moved us to know his word and to ultimately know him. So this, the judgment day, the judgment day will be a sad realization for so many biblically illiterate people who did not know God's word on the earth. Because of that, they do not know the great God of heaven whom they are standing before in judgment. They will hate themselves for neglecting the knowledge of God and his word because it will only result in their inability to know him in heaven because condemnation will only be our portion for eternity if we don't know him. May this motivate us to be a people of the book. And may each of us be the type of people who are committed to God and his word. And may that biblical knowledge allow us to grow mightily and prevail in our face to the glory of God. With that, cheerio, mate. Bob's your uncle. The Bible reveals to us God's plan for saving man. God has had a plan from the beginning. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we learn it, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. God's grace, His unmerited favor toward us. Then Christ shed His blood much more then having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Then we learn that the gospel is important. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation, the Holy Spirit's gospel. And then the faith, our faith, the sinner's faith, they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved, you and your household. His faith would lead him to obey the gospel plan of salvation. Then we learn the confession of the sinner that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8 verse 37, but also Romans 10, 10, with the mouth one believes, one confession with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then we learn part of God's plan for saving man is the sinner's repentance. Acts 17, verse 30, Truly the, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Then we must be baptized. He says there's also an antitype which now saves us baptism. He says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And then the Christian is, has work to do. We learn in James chapter 2, verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. The only place the Bible uses faith and only is to say we're not justified by faith only. The Christian has hope. Romans 8 and 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? And then we learn Revelation 2.10, do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful in the death and I will give you the crown of life. Matthew 10, 22, we are to endure to the end to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you found this video helpful and wish to learn more, be sure you download the note card that goes with this lesson and our free four-lesson Bible correspondence course. You will find the links in the description below. 
We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ, meeting at 405 Butler Street in Spring Hill, Louisiana, want to help you with your growth in your knowledge of God's Word. Remember, we are in it for the likes and the subs, so be sure to like us, subscribe to our channel, and tell others. Thanks for watching. In the meantime, in between time, we will see you next time. Cheerio, mate. And with that, Bob's your uncle.